thank you for doing this, much appreciated. Um, I'd like, if you don't mind, to take you back to the 80s. And I'm going out on a limb here because I'm assuming the 80s is when you would be a recent school leaver, a 16, 17 year old Sharon Britton. I'd like to set the scene for us, if you don't mind. May I also just interject and say Sharon Ivan at that Sorry. stage? Yes, I was uh, yes. Ivan, not Britton at that stage, He's but 16, absolutely. Year old Sharon Ivan, forgive me. Correct. So, Sharon, where's home in, in, in 16, 17 year old Sharon? 16, 17 year old Sharon's world, home is in Hertfordshire. I was born in Manchester and my parents moved when I was young to Hertfordshire. So that was where I was living at that time, in Hemel Hempstead. And, and what would 16, 17 year old Sharon have on her walls? Was she a music, a movies, a sports fan? A 16 to 17 year old Sharon. <laughs> um, yeah, music. I loved, I loved music, I loved sport. Um, I was fairly, um, fairly crazy as a teenager. Um, Are we talking Duran Duran? Were you a new romantic? I, I'm talking Duran Duran. Um, I've always liked, I've always been a bit of an old crooner. I like the Bee Gees, I like Barbara Streisand, I like Dinah Ross, I liked, I liked what I loved George Michael, I uh, loved Lionel Richie, but I've always, for some reason, I've always liked the sort of um, the music that I can relate to, sure. that I can, I can relate to the words. So um, yeah, even at 15, 16, I would listen to music that would um, reflect and look back on my childhood, which was fairly, um, fairly up and down, fairly up and down. And, and was 16, 17 year old Sharon ambitious? Was she yeah, studious? Always. Did she? No. No, I was, I was ambitious, I wasn't studious. I was terrible at school, I didn't work. I was focused on either, um, the, the sort of being naughty. Uh, I've, I've not been brilliant at, f at following, uh, you know, instructions when I was younger, instructions and rules, so I was always slightly rebellious. Um, but was I ambitious? Very, even from 11. Um, 11 years old, I remember I was the captain of Elm at school and on sports day I entered 11 races and won all 11. Um, my sister um, was watching and the next day in assembly they invited me up um, to, to, uh, to the stage and said that I was the first person in the history of the school to win 11 races out of 11. Um, so I've always had something within me at a very young age that knew that was very had a very steely determination. I bet you were popular that day, weren't you, with your schoolmates? I, I was. Yeah. I thought sports was brilliant because everybody always wanted me to be on there. You know, I always felt very loved around anything to do with sport because I was always picked very quickly to go on to somebody's team. Um, and was you socially conscious? You know, we, we, and I did the same. We grew up in Thatcher's Britain, and whilst I don't want to make this political, were you aware of of the North South divide and what the and what the country was becoming? Um, no, not at that age. I wouldn't say not at fifteen, sixteen. I was many things in that. I did, as I just said, I didn't study. I wasn't necessarily politically aware. Uh, I wasn't. Re I didn't really follow the news at that stage of my life. Um, I was quite loud and quite dominant, but I, I would say if you met people that knew me when I was 15, I, w I always had a very big heart. I was always kind yeah. and I was always fair yeah. um, in, in how I conducted myself as a, as a teenager. And do you think your teachers would have put you down as most likely to succeed? Did you have the drive that they would yes, have Yes, it's interesting you, you should say that. I look back and I remember a lot of my teachers very fondly. And I often remember, I even remember their names and them saying to me, Sharon, you've got so much potential, but you really need to focus and you need to knuckle down. And then I remember one teacher in particular, Mrs. Cox, who always said to me, Sharon, there's something about you that even if you don't necessarily succeed at school, I believe that you're going to succeed with whatever you do in life, which was so lovely at that time when, you know, at that age, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do or where I was going to go. But somebody had that belief in me at that young age that I might go on and do well. And did you go to college or did you get a job at no, 16, No, I left school 17? at 15 with no qualifications. Um, and then I went on to college and I think I got three... 3O levels. No, I was terrible. Um, and, you know, I certainly wouldn't advise any youngsters now to follow the journey that I followed and, and not to be studious. Um, but for some reason, for me, that didn't click. Sport did click. I absolutely love sport. I was the captain of the rounders team, captain of netball, fastest runner in the school. Count Sport, absolutely loved. But in terms of academic, no. No, I left school young because I also 
um, knew I wanted to go to work. I just knew, for me, I didn't want to go to university, I wanted to go to work and I wanted to earn money. So what was your first job? Um, I did a series of jobs. I worked on a market. Um, I, worked, uh, I worked for Reed Employment when I was young and I picked um, litter um, off, a, off a skip site. Um, I worked in shops. I did a newspaper round. I did an Avon round. I did anything that I um, could do that would earn me money. My parents didn't have money, so I had to go out and earn my own money. And I was never proud. I would do whatever needed to be done at that time to earn the money. Um, so I had, you know, pocket money in effect as it was in those days. So what happened that, that, that led you to be here? But obviously you got on a, a career path that led you here. Is there a moment in time where you took the right decision? Yeah, I started working with my business partner of 31 years, Nick Mason, when I was 23 years old, um, as in a very, very, very junior position. Um, actually, one thing I did do, I decided I needed to get a skill or learn something that not everybody would have and that would potentially help me when I went to look for a job. So I went to college, I went to night school, and I learned Pittman 2000 shorthand. Wow. Um, and then the job, working for Nick Mason, the junior secretarial job that was advertised in the Times in the creme de la creme on a Wednesday when I was 23, 22, 23. Um, it had this job, junior required, um, Pittman shorthand a must. <laughs> wow, that's great for me. And 147 people applied for that job. And I, I was very fortunate I, I got that job. And that was the start and, you know, of my journey. Um, not directly working for Nick Mason then, I was working for his financial director. Um, and yeah, I'd say that was uh, up until then, I drifted from, I worked in a hotel, I worked in the Royal Trafalgar Thistle Hotel, um, I worked in temping jobs with Reed Employment, so I did various different jobs, but that was the first time I found a job um, that obviously then sort of started my journey. And just for those people who may not know who Nick Mason is, can you just elaborate? Who is Nick Mason? Nick Mason is, um, he's, well, first and foremost, he's a wonderful man. Um, he's a wonderful friend, he and his family. I've been extraordinarily lucky to work with him for 31 years. Um, and he is also the, um, the drummer with Pink Floyd. So. I bet he knows how to throw a party then, doesn't he? He knows, <laughs> he knows how to throw a party. Um, and he's just, he's just a fantastic guy who I've been very lucky to work with for so many so many years. So if we take you forward now, is, is there a point in time that you can remember where you may have woke up and thought to yourself, do you know what, I'm going to be okay. Not necessarily I've made it, but I'm going to be okay. Is there a point where you thought... I'm there was a point in my life when I was 30 and I had my two children um, who were three and two. Um, and my first husband had um, issues, shall we say. And I decided at that stage, after being with him for 15 years, that it was the right thing, having two children, to end that relationship and to be on my own with Toby and Oliver. Um, and that was a real crossroads in my life as to um, which way my life would go. Um, I had a lot of challenges in my 20s, teens and 20s with mental health and mental well-being, um, with anxiety and claustrophobia, agoraphobia. I had many problems which I had to deal with, um, as well as being in a fairly dysfunctional first marriage. Um, so I think 30 was a really critical time for me for uh, making the very, very big, what was then the very big decision to bring up my children on my own and to work concurrently, yeah. And as a mother, you had to balance your, your role as a, as a business lady and, of course, to look after your two children as well. Um, if you look at it back then in the support you received compared to what's available now, do you think enough is done nowadays to, to support single working mothers, to allow them to achieve the things that, that you managed to achieve? Has there been much change, in your opinion? Um, in terms of... 30 years ago, 35 years ago, in terms of the mental health problems that I had, there was no support. I felt very alone. Um, it was not, the, it, it just wasn't talked about. It wasn't talked about within my family. 
it wasn't talked at with outside of the family so it's something I very much dealt with on my own and felt very alone um, and in terms of being a single mother at that time I just I was very I'm very determined I have a very steely determination my children came first first of always have first and foremost and I just um, I just knew I had to you know continue on my own with the boys you know working looking after them and that's what I did in terms of you and it's a funny one because before this interview and I know you and I have got to know each other a little bit over the last year or two um, I did a Wikipedia search on you and nothing exists Good, so you've wonderful. so you you've managed to keep your successes and yourself very very private is that a conscious choice you've made or is that just I have always been a very private um, person that's my nature I am very private and if I'm honest with you Jason the reason I did this interview with you today is because you have been hugely supportive to me over the last three years pre-acquisition post-acquisition at Bolton and when you asked me to do it I wanted to do it um, because it was you and because the kindness that you've shown me um, and I mean real kindness and real support um, as a way of saying thank you to you um, and because I I like you and I you know I think we've connected so it felt like the right thing to do as the years go on that will change by the way I promise you you know you'll like me less and less <laughs> as it goes on but but thank you that's a very very it's kind thing to say no, absolutely not uh, so it's not easy in today's day and age with the uh, social media what do you think of of the platforms of social media um, do you think you'd ever personally participate with a Twitter account I have or a anything huge like issue with social media a huge issue with the uh, what I call the phone, which I call the weapon of mass destruction. Um, it, it's I do no social media at all. I cannot understand how um, the things that are said to people and the way in which they are said and the effect that that has on people's mental health. Um, I, I think it's 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 just dreadful. It's really dreadful. And there has to be a way that these huge organisations are able to control um, and stop um, the, some of the truly vile things that are said. Um, and I think particularly coming into football um, from day one, I, I've always said I don't do any so social media and I don't, I'm sure, you know, things are directed at me, but I don't know what they are and I don't hear what they are because I don't do any such thing. It's funny actually because that was my next question because you do get mentioned mm -hmm. and I think generally speaking you've been mentioned in positive terms and you'll either know this or not but you refer to as either Auntie Sharon or Shazza <laughs> which do you prefer by the way because it's going to be one of the two. I like, I like either, yeah, I yeah. like either and do you know what Jason, I, nobody gets everything right all the time and I'm sure, I think what I hope that people see since I've been at Bolton is that I'm honest. I'm a very honest person. I've got a very good moral compass. Um, I'm tough. Mm. I'm absolutely tough in the boardroom. Um, but I do, my fundamental princi principles are very strong. And it's about doing the right thing in the right way. Um, and you can't please everyone. I'm a realist. You cannot please everyone all the time. Not in football. Not in football. And I don't mind people. I never have an issue with people having an opinion or, or a structured or a heated debate or a conversation. That I've got no problem with at all. But when you get personal vile tirades directed at sometimes the players uh, or sometimes the owners or when we're genuinely, well, I know I am genuinely trying to, to do good, um, it's just, it would be nice if people just had a little bit more tolerance. I mean, you have made some big calls and I'd just like to comment on a couple of them if you don't mind. The, the one I think that, that came out a while ago that surprised me was the change of policy in, in respect of the betting companies within the stadium. I mean, is that something that took a while for you to decide upon? Was that, was that something driven within the club? What, what was the thought process behind that? The thought process is talking back earlier to um, my um, first husband and the addictions that he had um, and the work that I now do with mental health and mental well-being um, and I see terrible 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 personal family stories um, of addiction drink gambling drugs 
and the ruination of not just the person but the families, the impact, the far-reaching impact on the families. Um, and particularly in football, everywhere you look, there is advertising for gambling. And if you look at the statistics of 11 to 16-year-olds who are struggling with gambling addiction, 11 to 16-year-olds uh, and the suicide rates, um, it's shocking. It's shocking. And I, and I, I don't... You know, alcohol, gambling, everything can be done in moderation. But the problem is a lot of these, um, they're not done in moderation. They go further than that and people get into the most awful, awful situations which often end in tragedy um, and heartbreak for so many people. So for me, I don't like gambling um, and I'd just rather that we didn't engage um, with gambling sponsorship. But that's just my preference and I respect other clubs, other businesses, they, they may choose, you know, we live in a democratic society, we can make our own decisions and not every decision that I make will suit everybody, like not everybody's decisions other people make will suit me. But that's, that's okay. I think we're allowed as individuals to make and follow what we believe in and I think we have to be able to speak out about what we believe in passionately and, and not receive that sort of awful torrent of, you know, what can come back at you um, and I go I, again I say if it's constructive you know communication coming back or a healthy debate I'm very happy to have that um, but what I don't like is when you put something out and you just get a barrage of, of abuse and I find that really disappointing. I understand you you previously get it before getting hold of Alton Wanderers had expressed an interest in owning a football club um, you're a savvy business person You've been in the trenches for many, many years. So my obvious question is, why? What were you thinking? Uh, I was thinking three things. One, I was brought up at Turf Moor, so I've been brought up in football all my life, and I absolutely love the game. Um, two, from having a lot of insight knowledge into the game, I did truly believe that if we do things in the way that I run the other companies that I work with, where we do it in an honest, ethical, transparent, decent, the right way, I think that that would be a differentiator um, in that, you know, I don't have an ego, I have no greed, I have no envy, I have no jealousy. I want to create a really cohesive team where we're all on the same side. You know, Jason, I laugh a lot. I, I laugh a lot. I, I want to, you know, I count my blessings every day and every evening. I want people to work with me to have fun. Um, and that's why when I came into this, I, I committed to a three year plan. Um, and at the end of the three years, if I'm still having fun and enjoying it, fantastic. And if I'm not, I've done three years and it's been the most, even with the pandemic, even with all the challenges, I've learned so much. I've learned so much about the business of football. Um, and I've really, I, I am enjoying it. It's been really hard work. It's been really challenging. We lost 70% of our revenue overnight. You know, that's a huge, huge challenge. Um, we've had to let people go from the business. Um, but again, even in those very, very difficult circumstances, I've always made sure that we've conducted ourselves in the right way. In, in, you know, because you can't always give people good news. Yes. Life is not like that. Um, it's, but if you are delivering not so good news, deliver it in the right, respectful way, and you communicate directly with the person so they're very clear on what you're saying to them. I mean, I'm a Bolton fan and, and I'm an insolvency practitioner, so I had the um, ability to be involved in this so I know how difficult it was to get this deal done and I would imagine there haven't been many other clubs that have gone through this process who have been bought that have had to overcome as many obstacles in getting this deal away and I think the administrator of the football club deserve real credit for that that having been said bearing in mind everything else that was going on at the time were you ever tempted to walk away and why didn't you because you must have been so dogmatic to get this done this was I was told this was the most difficult um, process of acquiring a football club through an administration process in the history of football um, and I mean part of that is me when I come, come up against something very challenging I tend to rise to the challenge um, but it, having said that this was very very complex yes. um, there were so many moving parts um, and there were times when I just 
thought, gosh, is this too, is this too hard to do? Um, and then as you know, in June 2019, I lost my sister suddenly. Um, and four days before she passed away, she texted me, how's it going with Bolton? And I said, bloody awful. And she said, whatever you do, promise me you'll never give up. So when she passed away and I went to bed for a month, it was, and thought, oh, I'm done. I think it was just looking at what she sent to me and that then just, I, you know, motivated me and I got on and I thought, yeah, no, I need to finish this. I need to do it. Um, but it was, I don't think I'll ever do a protracted negotiation or a com the complexities of, of this. And to be honest, the mess that it was in, you know, when we completed in August 2019 and then even over the next month or two or three months, understanding the enormity of the job um, w was quite daunting. So if we go away from Bolton and we just look at insolvency in general with, with, with football clubs, obviously there have been a few high profiles as, as well as Bolton. Wigan, that went into administration and they appear to have found a buyer and, and be on the way up and good luck to them for that. Tragically, Bury didn't quite get the same outcome, but more recently Derby County in the Championship, they've gone into administration. Do you feel for football clubs at the, at the lower league generally? It's the most extraordinary business in terms of you know, looking for sustainability. I mean, it's, um, Bolton is a great example. You know, a lot of these clubs are based on owner funding, which is great when the owner continues to fund the business. The problem there is when the owner stops funding the business, it very, very quickly falls apart. Yeah. And, 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 and That's what you know, Eddie here, Davis, it? God bless his soul, who was obviously an incredible man and funded this business and was an amazing person to have at this club. But when he decided to stop the funding, the way it spiralled, because it was running in an unsustainable way. Absolutely. So, you know, there's no other business that you run outside of football where you, because it's the emotion of football, the, you know, it's a unique industry and you do get very wealthy people who are prepared to commit the money I also don't think some of these people realise, and I've realised it over the last two and a half years, these are very stressful businesses to run. They're, very, they're high on emotion, high on emotion. You know, it can go, well, we've seen it here. You know, this time last year, we were 19th, 20th in League Two. Um, and it was, you know, everybody was, the fans weren't happy, rightly so. Um, it was, I had a very strong self-belief in where we were going, so that, you know, when people said to me, how do you do it? When you've got a strong self-belief in your journey, you, there is peripheral noise, but I follow my self-belief. So never last year did I ever think of any change in management, did I ever think of any change in personnel. I was on a journey, I knew the journey we were on, and I wasn't deviating from that journey. And then we got to January, we had the transfer window in January and you saw the run that we went on it. from January to getting promotion, which was, you know, nothing short of a miracle. Um, bringing on Ian Ever, absolute delight of a man to work with. Have you ever seen him smile, by the way? What does Ian Ever look like when he's happy? That's hilarious. I have seen him smile. I actually have. Um, it's not his natural disposition, I must say. Um, Ian's a fantastic guy. He's a fantastic guy. He's a fantastic manager. He's a fantastic person. Um, he has this extraordinary ability to, to cope with the stress. I'll tell you another thing I have realised, again, is a manager's job is high stress. You know, it really is high stress. And another thing that I do find, it, I think, in the industry that is wrong is that five games or five defeats and they're changing the manager. Well, that then brings not only the cost of that, it brings the whole rebuild. They take their team. You've got to bring in a new team. They want to bring in their own players. You've got the current players. So my mindset is you must give the manager the time to do his job. And never was that better proven than last year. Absolutely. You know, when everyone was up in arms in November, we gave Ian the time and we got promoted. In no other business, in no other world, do you do that and completely remodel your business no. after such a short Absolutely period of time. Not. And I do relate that sometimes to the other businesses that I run and how that I run them. And there's no other business that you run and on a five-week period you'd be firing the CEO. 
it just wouldn't it wouldn't make happen. any sense does it mm -hmm. yeah so whilst there is a lot of for october here's a great example where the games haven't gone quite to plan but in no way shape or form does that ever affect what i'm thinking about our plan for bolton i know where we're going and i know how we're doing it and do you think the way that the, the money is effectively waterfalled down from the Premier League to the to the lower leagues, do you think it's adequate? No, do you think it needs to change. There needs to be a fundamental change. And Rick Parry, who is a great guy, the chairman of the EFL, is um, working now and is being very instrumental and in, you know talking to Tracy Crouch about how he believes and what the changes need to be to make to ensure that the money's come down. You know, obviously there's huge monies in the Premier League, uh, but how some of those monies come down to the clubs in League One and League Two um, to make them more sustainable. And that can only be a good thing. How have you found the EFL then since you walked fantastic, through the doors? Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, Debbie Jevons, who I worked with when she was the interim chair through the period of time when we bought the business, was so supportive to me. Um, but I think she believed in me. I think she believed in what I was saying. I think she believed I was genuine, I was honest, I was trustworthy. Um, and, and I can't thank her enough because if it wasn't for Debbie, I'm not quite sure we would have, and her belief in me, that we would have got the deal done. Um, and then Rick Parry, Nick Craig, everyone I've dealt with at the, at the EFL have been first class. Because they have had quite a lot of flack over the last couple of years in yeah. terms of some of the decisions. Do yeah. you think they need to rethink the rules on insolvency? If I use you as an example, you come into a club, you've had no prior involvement, and you've come in and you've had to pay over the odds for it because you have to, you have to hit the deadlines, the criteria, then you suffer an embargo, you've got certain deadlines where you have to sign players, so you are being given a set of rules to put right something that you had nothing to do with going yeah. wrong in the first place. Do you think that will effectively stop clubs that might have these issues from being bought? Do you think there needs to be a rethink about where the punishment should lie or do you think that they are workable as they are? Well, I think we go back to the sustainability piece and the further funding coming into the lower league clubs because what I don't think works is to have a model where you're solely, you're only your model can only continue with significant owner funding. That, you know, and you know, you look at Derby and, and, and the owner of Derby put a huge amount of money into that club and unfortunately still was unable to really make it work. Um, so I think there's this enormous, there has previously been an enormous pressure that you have to spend on player wages. And I've done a lot of research and I've done a lot of analysis because I do a lot of due diligence in the businesses and every business I do that. And the correlation of the huge spend does not necessarily get you in football where you think it's going to get you. Absolutely, it guarantees nothing, does it? Correct. So for me, I, I, you know, where we are now in League One, I, I'd say we're probably ninth or tenth in terms of what we've spent. But in terms of sustainability and putting a really smart CD management team around the business, um, I think that will be really interesting to see how it plays out for now for the rest of the season. Um, and again, it's the right people doing the right job in the right way. You know, there's a huge amount of emotion and ego in football and, you know. And you walked in um, on day one with this wave of euphoria behind you. Were you prepared for the size of the task of the, of the turnaround that you needed? Had you done your due diligence, not on what you were buying, but what you had to fix? Or did anything catch you by surprise? Does it continue I, to catch you by surprise? I did the due diligence. I did a huge amount of due diligence because it would have been bonkers not to have done because it was such a big club to buy. What I don't think that I possibly really understood is how closely every single thing you do is analysed and out there in some way. And everybody's got an opinion, haven't they? Forum. Yeah, and everybody's got an opinion. And I don't mind people's opinions. I will listen to people's opinions, but ultimately I'm, I'm running this and I will ultimately make a decision that I believe is best and right for the football club. You know, we're custodians of this football club and I want to do the very, very best I can for this club. Um, and make sure I leave it in a very different place till I found it. And where that leaving place is going to be, whether we were in the championship or beyond, or we get to the place to the championship, and it needs significant funding, I will always do what's best for the club um, and not what's best for me. And that's the lens that I look through.
And if that's a three-year journey, it's a three-year journey. If it's a five-year journey, it's a five-year journey. And I've also said and said from day one, as long as I'm enjoying it and my family are enjoying it and they're not affected in any way. Um, and I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I feel very, I've been made to feel very welcome here. I've been made, the fans, the community, the university, the town. Um, I've met some delightful people. Um, yeah, and through all the challenges and the difficult times. Um, well, let's talk about that because things aren't difficult enough for you. You come in, we, you employ a manager, and I think, was it 10 players in one day you had to sign? And that was bonkers. Did, did you know that or did it just evolve during the day? What was that day like, Sharon? No, that day... Was, you signed a team, didn't you, that really? That day, uh, that initial first season was incredibly difficult mm. because I was new to the business and you think you know business, but actually until you're in the business, living it day to day, you don't really understand it. With, like you say, no players, having to put the players together very quickly, it, was, it would have been nothing short of a miracle if we had, you know, even with the pandemic finishing us in closing the season in March 2020, I think the task for that season was almost impossible. Because yeah. you know, that's the other thing I've learned. You cannot pick up a football club that was where this club was. It is not a quick fix. No. It's two to three years to rebuild, rebuild in the right way, rebuild with the right people, get the right players. Um, and I've never ever known a business where there's so many things that can go wrong. Yeah. You know, you you know, you've got people. You know, people agents like to move players. They like to move managers. You know, they like to churn people. Um, so there's an incredible, you know, if somebody's doing well, somebody wants to take them. If somebody's not doing well, they want you to fire them. So it's very, very difficult for all the parts of the puzzle to come together and to get longevity. So that's what I'd like to achieve here. I'd like all the pieces of the puzzle to come together. And then I want my CEO, my CFO, Neil Hart and Steve Phillips and Mike Pink and Ian Everett and Chris Markham. You know, we've got fabulous, fabulous people here now and I'd like them to stay on the journey. I want us all to be on the journey together, travelling in the same direction. How did, because obviously it's, it's not difficult enough and then Covid hits, the pandemic hits, the shutdown of the stadiums, what did that do for somebody that is obviously very financially astute and works on forecasts, then all of a sudden you're ripping them up yeah, and starting quite a again? Lot of sleep this I can night. imagine. How, how there was a lot of two o'clock in the morning waking up thinking, where is this going? Because it was an unknown. Absolutely. It was a totally unknown you know, it was something that none of us could have ever foreseen. We have an incredible group of investors, there's only five of us, and I can honestly say, literally, we've barely had a crossword over the whole two and a half years. Um, I do lead the business, and I think that's the other thing, I think you need a leader. You need a leader. The bravity of Michael even doing this astounds me because he's the local Bolton businessman, yes. you know, and he's the super fan. Yes. So he, you know what it's like, you know all the emotion that comes with that. So I think maybe having just one super fan is enough. Is. And then the balance of, of the other investors um, not, not being of the same um, ilk is really helpful. So give us a, an insight behind the scenes if you don't mind, because I appreciate from here you go to a board meeting and I know how tough you can be, but I also know how effervescent you are as well. Yeah. What's, what's a board meeting like at Bolton Wanderers? Assuming it's just a normal one and there's nothing specific that's happened. A board meeting at Bolton Wanderers is like any other company that I'm involved with. We have what I like. I like to have rigour around a business. I want to know what is going on in the business. I want to have a budget. I want to have a plan. I want to have a plan that we're tracking. So when we have our board meetings, um, you know, Neil, our CEO, who came from Burnley, um, presents and we go through every single aspect of the business. Um, it's very transparent, it's very honest, it's very open. That's where I run this club. There are, you know, there are no secrets. You know, we talk about the finances, we talk about the funding, um, we talk about everything. Um, so everybody feels, there's no surprises. And what I absolutely don't ever want anyone to feel is a nervousness around their job because you can't get the best out of people if they're feeling nervous that they're going to be fired in three weeks. 
And that is not what we want here. We want everybody to feel they wake up, they enjoy coming to work, we have a laugh, we're all together. Um, I, I don't have any nonsense of, I just, it's me. If I've got something to say, I will say it to the person. I don't talk behind people's backs yeah. because what's the point yeah, in doing that? Absolutely. So I think from, in terms of a leadership point of view, I think people in the business now fully understand if I've got something to say, I will say it to them. I am driven and I do have high standards. So I expect the people that work with me to come to the board meeting and to deliver what I want to hear. So I fully understand every single area of the business um, and how we're tracking. And then you don't get any horrible surprises. You'll always get things in football that pop up unexpected. Um, but generally now I think we're, you know, with the administration process um, coming through that, um, you know, the pre-acquisition and the pre-acquisition costs were enormous. Um, but they're gradually coming down, you know, we, we've, you know, very sad for unsecured creditors that didn't get all their money. Um, but that unfortunately is part of the process of a football club and the previous owner and it being going into administration. I think it's fair to say as well as somebody who saw the data room that it was a moving feast as well. You walked into something you thought and it probably changed on a daily basis, did it not? But again, I'm very good. I'm quite good at dealing with, I'm quite, I manage stress quite well. And so whatever problem is presented, I'll sit down with whichever person in whichever department and then work through pragmatically, sensibly, how we're going to resolve this and what is the best way forward. Um, I don't think you could do the job that I do if you were a panicker or, or, or if you, you know, freaked out or, or you've just, you've got to be measured. You've got to be measured, you've got to be calm, you've got to be focused, you've got to be firm. I mean, don't get me wrong, Jason, I'm tough. I can make tough, you know that. Absolutely. I can make very tough decisions when required. Um, but I don't feel that you need to do the shouting and swearing and rude to staff. That's not the way I work. I can be firm, direct, fair, but equally, I'm not always going to be able to tell people what they want to hear or good things. Sometimes I have to deliver news which isn't so good, and I can do that as well. Uh, but I'll deliver it in a way that people understand what I'm saying and why and what is the reason behind it. So when you're not Sharon Britton, Chairman of Bolton Wanderers, and you go home and you close your door, how do you relax? Do you switch off? I mean, um, what, what, what's a good night for Sharon when you're not watching football or thinking about business? I. I do relax. My, my best achievement in my life by a million miles are my four children. So, um, you know, I, I, I've lost my dad, sadly passed away, my sister's passed away, my mum's in a care home, so I, I go and visit my mum. Um, but my absolute number one focus is my children and instilling the values that I have into my children, which is, you know, respect and kindness and honesty and decency and doing things in the right way and not chasing money and not being envious of anyone else and counting the blessings that you do have and not thinking about what you don't have and helping people, being kind to people, you know, doing kind things on a daily basis and doing them quietly. You know, I find in the work that I do uh, to help people, I do it in a very quiet way. Um, because that, I, I find that very, I just, I enjoy helping people quietly. But do you ever get to sit on your sofa in your PJs and put Netflix on and watch something or have a movie? All the time, oh, Sundays are, the Sundays are PJs, Netflix, chilling out, no makeup, no hair done, relaxing. Have you got Amazon Prime? Yeah. Have you seen Clarkson's The Farm? Jeremy Clarkson on The oh, Farm. Oh, funny enough, I was talking oh, about that yesterday. Because. Jeremy is friends with Nick, my business partner, oh, no. and I was, I've told it's absolutely hilarious. Oh, it's incredible. It so is, it's it something that I've got on my list of things to do, yeah. And what about uh, uh, an equivalent to Sunderland Till I Die? Sunderland Till I Die. Yeah, because a Bolton Wanderers Till I Die maybe, is there any I chance of I have been that? asked, yeah. I have been asked. I don't, um, to me, one of the reasons I came into football was to do good, and I want to do good in a big platform, in a scalable, in a big way. Um, and whether that's mental health and mental well-being and whether that's racism or um, I want and if we taking Bolton Wanderers from where it was in the precarious position it was to hopefully the championship and beyond and already I've noticed that I met with the prison service yesterday and I'm looking and talking to them about reform in the prison service um, I went to HMP Forest Bank two weeks ago um, and I have a great passion for um, helping people who have offended and to try and um, 
get involved in their journey so they don't reoffend and when they come out they've got the help and the support that they need because people have very very difficult lives Jason very difficult lives um, and I think for me finding where I've got to in my life um, I'd really like to try and impactfully help um, others to improve and enhance their lives. My final question was, when this is all over, what does success look like for you? I think you've actually just answered that question, haven't you? But um, I want to thank you so much for doing this. You um, are so welcome. Good luck with your board meeting. Thank good luck with the match tonight. Thank you very much Thank indeed. you ever so much, Sharon. You're really very appreciate more, it. Very, very welcome. And, and thank you for all your support over the last three years, Jason. Um, you've, you've been a brick and I really do appreciate it.